This is Spider-Man, you're watching Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. Welcome to another episode of Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. I'm Jill. And I'm Nick. And as always, we want to thank our sponsors, Lawrence Technological University, where possible is everything. And we have an amazing show today because it's full of Spider-Man. Yeah. And we're going to swing over to Richie, who's going to tell us about the new Spider-Man home video releases. Excellent. Hey, where's Emma? Where's Kirsten? Well, while we're waiting for them, here's this week's picks. I, I told them this time, they, they said they'd be here. Since it's Spider-Man week here on Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi, you know we're going to be checking out Spider-Man Homecoming, which makes its way to home video this week. Homecoming was a much needed hit with both audiences and critics, so Sony is pulling out all the stops by releasing the movie in every conceivable format, including 4K, Blu-ray, 3D, DVD, and HD digital. Wait, what? No Laserdisc or VHS version? How am I supposed to watch it? Oh! Our friends are up there! Hey, where are you going? What are you hiding, Peter? I'm just kidding, I don't care. Bye. Also coming out this week is the Spider-Man Legacy Collection in 4K. Sony originally released this five movie set back in June on Blu-ray. This 4K version includes Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3, plus the amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2. You also get the editor's cut of Spider-Man 3, which tries to salvage the worst of the Raimi films. While interesting for the die-hard Spidey fans, this new cut of the movie still doesn't do enough to correct that misfire. I know this is an all Spider-Man episode, but we can't overlook a very important new Blu-ray release. Batman vs. Two-Face comes out on October 17th and features the last Adam West performance as Batman. Batman vs. Two-Face is an animated follow-up to last year's nostalgic and fun Return of the Cape Crusaders. It features the same team including Burt Ward and Julie Newmar, but this time around we also get the one and only William Shatner as the villainous Harvey Dent. Get the lead out, or I'll put the lead in. Oh, thank God, that's over. All oh, the blood is rushing to my head. Someone get me down from here, please. Thanks, Richie. Look at you taking the lead, climbing the corporate ladder. Where's Nick? Oh, yeah, that's right. He's at Great Lakes Con Con. Hey, this is Nick with Comic Spear and Sci-Fi, and it is my genuine thrill to be sitting next to Nicholas Hammond, the very first actor to play Spider-Man and Peter Parker in a live-action context in the late 1970s show, which aired on CBS. And Mr. Hammond has had a wonderful career as a child actor. He was in The Sound of Music, and we learned you were in The Lord of the Flies. Yes. And okay, now what the fans are waiting for, tell us how you got involved in the Spider-Man project. Well, um, I was, again, I was doing a play uh, in Los Angeles. I was doing uh, an Oscar Wilde play, The Importance of Being Earnest. Who knew that uh, the night that the CBS executives came to see the show, I didn't know they were in the audience, and the next day I got a call asking if I would come in and talk to them about playing this character I had never heard of in my life called Peter Parker. And the more I heard about it, the more interested I got, and they got interested, and we all decided we wanted to just go for this and make the guy as believable and real as we possibly could. So that was our, um, that was our objective, and I have to say, listening to people here today, it's, it's wonderful to hear the stories of how many people found it a really enjoyable show when they were young. Yes, and you were part of a pretty big boom at the time. There was the Hulk, there was Doctor Strange, there was Wonder Woman, there was a $6 million man. How did it feel to be part of this superhero craze of the 70s? Well, you know, it was that. I mean, in, in some ways we were kind of fumbling in the dark because, I mean, at the time we shot the pilot to Spider-Man, there were no other shows that were actually on the air yet. Uh, Hulk was in production and the others were, were soon to follow. So we had no idea how the public would react to this. And frankly, I had no idea this kind of fan base existed. And then when it aired on CBS and we were the highest rated show of the year for CBS and suddenly you realize, wow, there are a lot of people out there that read Marvel comics and that are great fans of Stans and great fans of Spider-Man. 
So I was, I was honored to be a part of it. And are you planning on doing any more shows like this? Well, you know, I, I've, I've sort of got the bug here because I've enjoyed this. This is the first Comic Con I've ever done. But everybody keeps talking to me about New York and New York and New York. So I'm really quite tempted the idea of sort of putting my hand up to see whether there's any interest in having me at the Comic Con in New York. I think you'll find there might be. Mr. Hammond, thank you so much and best of luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. And now it's time for my favorite segment of the show, cosplay. And we're going to go to Mark at the Motor City Comic Con. I'm here with four of the Sinister Six. I'm here with Shocker. Hey, Shocker. Mysterio. <laughs> the Rhino. I'm the Rhino. And Sandman. What other two of the Sinister Six are you guys waiting for? Oh, we got a Doc Ock and a Craven. What is taking them so long? I don't know. There's more room to park this year, so they can't use parking as an excuse. Super villains need to park their cars just like everyone else. So tell me, guys, what uh, gave you the ideas to come up with these uh, the cool concept of uh, your costumes? We like Marvel a lot, and we wanted a cool group, and we thought we'd never seen a Sinister Six group, so we thought it'd be a cool one that a lot of people like because they're older. So how did you guys come up with the costumes? What is this stuff made of? How about starting with you? Uh, mine is made out of EVA foam. It's like floor mats that kind of looks like armor. And the horn, I, uh, this material, if you heat up, it gets real hard like a horn. If you want to feel it, the front of it's real hard, kind of, like a real horn. This, I had a one day inspiration. I built this yesterday out of mostly odds and ends in the garage and a few other items. But I have, underneath this is a buoy. And then I got uh, agility cones on the ball. Then covered it all over in vet wrap and spray painted it. She sewed the shirt and the pants. She found a material that looked kind of like uh, his uh, outfit. These are uh, pieces of foam we cut and we carved them, eyeballs. The cape's a piece of velvet purple that works good for capes. And that's an old uh, astronaut helmet we covered in this see-through uh, spray. This is a yellow morph suit and I, I used uh, fabric paint for the for all the little designs. This is made out of the same material as his costume, it's EVA foam. And I used a fabric glue for the rest. Thanks, Mark. That was some great cosplay. Those were awesome. Makes me think of some role play ideas. Something's tingling and it's not my spider sense. I think we better go to a commercial. You're watching Comics Beer and Sci-Fi. Stay tuned for more. Out of all the burger and beer joints, you walk into this one. Good call, because now you're face to face with the best burger you'll ever have. Handcrafted, locally sourced, and grilled to perfection. Bagger Dave's, locals wanted. Hello, my lady. I ordered two large Howie Mowies with butter cheese crust. Wow, you are one serious breast cancer awareness supporter. Warrior for love, hope, and pizza. Can't seem to reach my wallet. <laughs> Flavor fanatics love us because for every pizza purchased in October, we make a donation to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. Hungry? Howie! I want a career in robotics and automation, so I chose Lawrence Tech for its first in Michigan robotics engineering program. LTU's brand new STEM complex has a robotics lab where we can design, build, and program robots in a creative atmosphere. And the best thing is, I haven't graduated yet, but I already have a job in my field. I know I made the right choice for my career. Lawrence Tech, possible is everything. Welcome back, thanks for sticking around. And now we're gonna do my favorite segment, beer. This segment is sponsored by Bagger Dave's, a proud supporter of local craft beer. Stop in today for the best damn burger and beer. Hey, it's Shannon, swinging in with a few of your friendly neighborhood beers that pair perfectly with all things Spider-Man. Spider-Man is so cool due to his ability to swing from building to building. I see him hopping off windows all the time. In other words, I would consider Peter Parker to be an excellent glass hopper. So I have a beer called Glass Hopper from Maumee Bay Brewing Company. This is a nicely balanced IPA at 7% ABV. It contains copious amounts of centennial hops, which makes for an undeniable floral aroma and flavor. Spider-Man doesn't just spend his time swinging from buildings, he has to do a fair bit of fighting too. Let's start with one of his most famous enemies, Venom. I have a gorgeous orange colored beer called Hot Venom from Boneyard Beer. 
They're based in Bend, Oregon, which is home to many great breweries. Hot Venom contains 4.5 pounds of hops per barrel, making this West Coast double IPA a direct strike to your nervous system with a venomous mix of Simcoe, Centennial, Chinook, and CTZ hops. Hot Venom's delicate malt profile allows a bright tangerine flavor and light pine aroma to dominate. One of Spider-Man's oldest villains is Vulture. If you're super smart like Vulture, you'll sip on five vultures from Five Rabbits, which is the first US-based Latin American inspired brewery. Based in Chicago, Illinois, Five Rabbits brings the energy, passion, and amazing richness of Latin culture and cuisine to the delicious world of craft beer. Five Vultures is an excellent example, featuring ancho chilies and unrefined sugar. A caramel, strong sugar, some peppery clove, and a wonderful chili flavor never overwhelms, but also lingers nicely. When talking about Spider-Man's villains, you can't leave out Dr. Otto Octavius. The only thing Spider-Man needs to help him fight Doc Ock is a bit of evil octopus from Mayday Brewery in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. This inky black beer is loaded with eight hop additions, one for each leg. At 6.2% ABV, I think you might be able to drink eight of these and still have the ability to fight Doc Ock with Spider-Man. Now grab a few of these delicious drinks or save some in your web for later. Thanks, Shannon. Those beers look great. Now here's Nick with a quick Spider-Man history lesson. Where did Spider-Man come from? Well, in 1962, fresh after doing the Fantastic Four and the Incredible Hulk, Stanley had this sort of burning idea that he wanted to try out. He wanted to have a teenage superhero who wasn't a sidekick to an adult superhero such as Batman and Robin or Captain America and Bucky. He went to his publisher and, and talked about this character and said he wanted to call him Spider-Man because one of Stan's favorite characters as a kid in the pulp magazines was called the Spider, Master of Men. And he was just a crime fighter who wore a ring with a spider on it. So Stan loved that character, and he decided once again to rely on good old radioactivity to provide the powers, in this case, a energized radiated spider, who would of course bite young Peter Parker as the character eventually became, and he would gain his powers as Spider-Man. So Stan's publisher said, you're out of your mind, nobody likes spiders, it's a ridiculous idea, but Stan says, but wait, I want to put it in Amazing Fantasy number 15, which is going to be the final issue of that comic book. We're going to kill the comic. Doesn't matter if the story's in there, doesn't matter what's in it, but I want to get this off my chest. A few months later, the letters started coming in, the sales figures started coming in, and they had a hit. The Amazing Spider-Man number one came out a few months later, and of course, the comic became a pop culture icon. He had a great supporting cast. He had an aunt who was constantly ailing. He was bullied in school. His problems were Spider-Man's problems, and vice versa. Spider-Man might be fighting a bad guy and worried how he's going to get Aunt May or medicine, or Peter Parker might be in high school trying to figure out how he's going to beat the Sandman. The first major black character in a comic book was in Spider-Man, Joel Robertson, who worked at the Daily Bugle. There were a few issues of Spider-Man that dealt with Harry Osborn being addicted to drugs, and the Comics Code Authority famously refused to sanction these issues, but Marvel went ahead and published them anyway. Eventually, of course, uh, he had a great cartoon in the late 60s, and then a live-action show in the late 70s, and several more animated incarnations, and then finally we get to the feature films begun by Sam Raimi in the late 90s. This is Nick with Comics Beer and Sci-Fi. In Spider-Man Homecoming, Peter Parker has a talking suit that helps him fight crime. Well, in the 80s, there was a talking car that helped David Hasselhoff fight crime. Here's Joe Johnson with Kit. Welcome to Hollywood Car Minute. I'm Joe Johnson, and I am joined by Mel Guthrie. And behind us is the iconic Kit from Knight Rider, Knight Industry 2000. Mel, what can you tell me about this car here behind us? The hood is actually from a bona fide car that used to be on the television show. From what I understand, the interior, everything is, is screen accurate. Oh yeah, it lights up, it's beautiful. It's like, it's amazing inside that car. Does it talk that you know of? No. <laughs> it doesn't talk. <laughs> oh, what a great car to have in anyone's collection. One of my all-time favorites. One of the greatest cars in television history. Mel, thanks for joining me, and that'll wrap up this Hollywood Car Minute. Ah, Kit. And now just think everyone has a talking car. And speaking of talking, here's two people that don't stop talking. Here's Brad and Q. Hey, it's the Bradcast. It's Comic Experience Sci-Fi. I'm here with The Q. How's it going? And so, with Spider-Man, you gotta figure, you gotta talk about the villains. Because even though he is one of the oldest, longest, and most well-loved heroes, he has some of the most prolific and insane 
villains. Q? He does. He does. You know, I like to compare his rogues gallery to that of Batman. They're actually, it's really good. It's like his rogues gallery makes him a better hero because his villains are so good. As unlikely as they all are, whether they are self-manufactured like Norman Osborn or revenge-driven like his son. Or like uh, Venom, revenge-driven. Yeah, I was going to say, the, the symbiote-generated villains, Venom and Carnage. One of my favorite Spider-Man villains, and they've yet to do him in the movies, is uh, Mysterio. He kind of reminds me of Clayface. Oh, yeah. You know, he's totally Clayface. The misunderstood actor, you know, and he's an illusionist, master of illusions. And then you have another complex character like the Lizard, who on one end is Peter Parker's friend and mentor, and then on the other end is one of his most hated rivals. I mean, I'm going to just keep saying that I'm not happy with the way they did the Vulture because, you know, the Vulture was an old man trying to He was a really people. old man. Yeah, yeah. Stealing yeah. people's youth. Yeah. Yet, a, yet another Marvel change. change. <laughs> another Marvel <laughs> changing the book to suit their horrible needs. And why did they cast Birdman? I mean, Batman. I mean, Birdman. I mean, because he played a bird and a bat. So he's, okay. So he's already got his wings. Yet another bad idea. This has been the Q and the Bradcast. <laughs> Talking about Spider-Man Villas. All right, we'll see you next time. Well, thanks, Brad and Q. Of course, we had to cut them a little bit short, but if you want to hear them talk about everything, make sure you go to our YouTube channel and check out some of their podcasts. And we do need a quick break, so we'll be back after these short messages. I want to be a dermatologist, and though a lot of universities tried to recruit me for basketball, Lawrence Tech had the science curriculum that I wanted. LTU Southfield campus is a great place to learn, and the classes are small enough that I don't have to wait for office hours to talk to my professors. They're usually right by my side, challenging me and guiding me toward a successful future. Lawrence Tech, possible is everything. I'm here today at Northwestern Tech, the HVAC school in Southfield, to see how they're training their students for the growing demand in the heating and cooling industry. With our years of experience and literally thousands of successful graduates, Northwestern Tech has been debunking this myth that you need a four-year degree to have a great career. Our HVAC program was designed to give our students the hands-on skills to be working in the field in only 10 and a half months. This is Heather Park reporting from Southfield that Northwestern Tech really is the HVAC school that works. We don't frost brew our beer, and hot chicks won't appear if you drink it. Our beer doesn't come in a bow tie shaped can, or need color indicators to tell you it's cold. It won't be delivered by Clydesdale horses, and to tell you the truth, we aren't the most interesting people in the world. Fact of the matter is, we don't tell stories. We just let our beer do the talking. Thanks for hanging around on our special Spidey show. And here's Nick with a very animated interview. And I am here with Paul Souls. Uh, you know, there's Tom Holland, there's Nicholas Hammond, there's Andrew Garfield, there's Tobey Maguire. But for me and a whole generation of Gen Xers and baby boomers, this is Spider-Man. Mr. Souls did the voice of the animated Spider-Man in the late 60s. It was the first time we'd ever seen Spider-Man on TV. It was the first time his origin had ever been told on TV. My career has been more good fortune than good management. And so the good luck to have been cast for the voice uh, of Spider-Man and Peter Parker in this series, the first of many big series where the voice tracks were done in Toronto, Canada, which is where I was born and raised. Spider-Man, the character, was probably only about four or five years old when this cartoon was first done. Did you know the Spider-Man character when you were uh, offered the job? No. I in a way ashamed or embarrassed to say. Because remember, it had only been about four years. And I don't think, I think a lot of people kind of looked at Stan Lee when he created it and said, what, you've got a superhero who was wearing a full costume, he's not very good getting it on with the girls, and he's a scientist and teenager. I mean, this is not a superhero. Well, Lee persisted, of course, and the rest is legend. 
for my money, no one has ever played that character better than you. You captured Peter Parker and Spider-Man both so perfectly. How did you prepare to play the role? How did you tackle the role, if you will? Nick, you're very kind, but for a person like me, not a big stud, uh, wildly good looking, right? Peter Parker was a lot easier to play. An earnest guy, enjoyed taking pictures, keen to be a good employee, work for J. Jonah Jameson. To play Spidey though, a superhero, uh, was not that easy. The great legendary Paul Souls has been my privilege and pleasure to interview you, sir. Thank, Thank you so, so much. Hi there, this is Samantha from Comic Experience Sci-Fi. This gaming segment is brought to you by Lawrence Technological University. We all know there has been countless Spider-Man movies, TV shows, and comic books. But we've also had almost 40 years of Spidey video games. Here's a few of our favorites. The very first title to feature Marvel's Web Slinger was released in 1982 for the classic Atari 2600 console. By today's standards, the graphics look ancient, but you've got to start somewhere, right? Trouble up ahead. Let's go, Spider-Man. By 1991, technology advanced considerably. Peter Parker made his coin-operated arcade debut with the Sega-produced Spider-Man the Video Game. This side-scrolling fighting game also allows co-op play with Hawkeye, Black Cat, and Namor. The year 2000 brought 3D gameplay to Spider-Man thanks to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater game engine. After that, we basically had a new game every year for the next decade and a half, including the handheld game Mysterio's Menace for Game Boy Advance and several that served as successful movie tie-ins. Some of the other standouts were 2005's Ultimate Spider-Man, which featured animation that seemed to be ripped right out of a comic book. In 2010, we got one of the most unique titles, Shattered Dimensions. This game required players to play in four different timelines, including a future world set in 2099 and a film noir 1920 setting. And coming sometime in the first half of 2018 is Marvel's Spider-Man, which is a brand new open world action adventure game. This is the first Spidey game published by Sony, the same company that owns the movie rights to the character. That's a whole lot of web-slinging, wall-crawling action. Hoping it missed your favorite Spider-Man video game. This has been Samantha on Comic Sphere and Sci-Fi. Game over, man. And now it's time for our last commercial break. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for all of our behind-the-scenes shenanigans. I want to blend my business education and athletic skills and open my own fitness center. At Lawrence Tech, I'm learning how to research, present, and to really think like an entrepreneur. And I love the small college feel here, where there's always something to do. We have men's and women's intercollegiate sports and dozens of student organizations. I can't wait to apply what I'm learning here in the real world. Lawrence Tech, possible is everything. When every seat in the house looks like this, there are no bad seats. Pull up a chair and get face to face with the best burger you'll ever have. Bagger Dave's, locals wanted. I'm here today at Northwestern Tech, the HVAC school in Southfield, to see how they're training their students for the growing demand in the heating and cooling industry. As an industry, we're in serious need of new technicians entering the field. But to work for me, you need to be trained right. That's why at Flame, we insist to go to Northwestern Tech. It's simple. If you want a career in heating and cooling, Northwestern Tech is a place for you. I highly recommend it. This is Heather Park reporting from Southfield that Northwestern Tech really is the HVAC school that works. Welcome back, my fellow wall crawlers. And here's Casey with what's new in comic books this week. Hey, comic book geeks and you sci-fi freaks. Comic book Casey coming at you representing Comic Spear and Sci-Fi. Currently, we are at Comic City in West Bloomfield. I'm here with my friend Aaron right now. We're here to tell you about the latest and greatest of the new comic book releases this week. What do you got for me? First off, we have Ragman number one. It's about a story of a war veteran, Rory Harper, who finds a suit of souls when he's tomb raiding with his unit. It allows him to draw upon the souls of different criminals and stuff that he's captured. 
totally different origin, maybe even a different name, because back when Ragman first came out in, what was it, 76? 76. I think his name was Roy Regan. Roy Regan. He's yes. probably a Vietnam War vet back then, but now he's a Desert Storm War vet, more than likely. Yep. All right, so I think it'd be a good read, especially considering that it's a character currently on a very popular hit TV show, Arrow. I definitely will check it out. It's pretty good. The next book is going to be Mr. Miracle number three. It's going to continue doing stuff with Darkseid and Big Barda and Orion and stuff. This is currently, as we know, Jack Kirby's 100th anniversary. Mr. Miracle is a creation of Jack Kirby from back in 1971. All right, so there's another book that's coming out that we should take a look at in your opinion. What is that called? It's called God Complex Number no. 1 by Image Comics. It's about a murder mystery in a cyberpunk world. Okay, now that story is by Paul Jenkins. I read a little bit of the preview, so I'm going to trust your judgment. You're recommending it. Taking your word for that. If I don't like it, you're going to be the first to know. I'll take responsibility. So the next book we're going to talk about is Amazing Spider-Man 789. Yes. Uh, Marvel's going back to their legacy numbers, and they're trying to gear up for Amazing Spider-Man 800. From what I read about it so far, it's about Peter Parker, or kind of like a rise and fall of Peter Parker. Yeah, lately he had a multi-billion dollar company, and now he's back to being poor and living on couches again. 800 will be coming soon. I'm going to be the first person in line in this store to buy it, and I'm going to annoy you with my web shooter. Man, Casey, that's really annoying. And? I got your web shooter fluid. Refill. And now we're going to close out the show with Mark and what's new in the movies this week. It's fortunate for the web slinger that the King Pin is too preoccupied in laying out my nefarious plan to reveal what's coming out in theaters this week. First out, Jackie Chan plays a humble businessman like myself, who must seek justice when his daughter is killed by terrorists. Pierce Brosnan co-stars as a government official who may be tied to the killer's identity. Chan reminds me of a certain wall crawler I know. He's ahead of us every step of the way. Open it up. Second this week is Happy Death Day. The diabolical plot surrounds a college student who relives the day of her murder until she can identify the killer. If only Gwen Stacy had it so good. <laughs> and lastly this week is the biofilm Marshall about the first African-American Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. The film stars Chadwick Boseman, who also plays Marvel's Black Panther. I knew there was something about him I didn't like. Sam Friedman, good to meet you, Sam. Hey, give me a hand with these, would you? What have you got in here, cement? Guns. Books, Mr. Friedman. This concludes our business arrangement this week. I'm off to crush a pesky little spider. Thanks, Mark. And we've reached the end of another episode of Comics Beer and Sci-Fi. Thank you again to our sponsor, Lawrence Technological University, where possible, possible is, is everything. everything. And as they used to say in the old Spider-Man comics, keep thy webs untangled. See you next week, Spidey Geek. Okay, we are at Great Lakes Comic Con with Otto Octavius, better known as Dr. Octopus. Uh, Doc, how's it going here at the show? Well, uh, you can see it's going real well. Now, how much trouble has, been, has Spidey been giving you lately? He's everywhere! Every time I turn around, he's here!